Welcome everyone to our second edition of Role Models in Tech. Today, I'm very honored to welcome our new speaker, Mrs. Laura Chinchilla. Mrs. Chinchilla was the first female president of Costa Rica. Before that, she was the vice president of Costa Rica, before that a Congress member, and she was also the national minister of security. I'm very honored to have her here because I'm also Costa Rican. Let me tell you a little bit more about Mrs. Laura Chinchilla. She has been an international advisor in Latin America and Africa for international organizations such as the Inter-American Development Bank, the UN Development Program, and the USAID for Development Agency. She's part of the Board of Advisors for SEC International, and she works a company focused on the empowerment of women through the use of digital technologies. She's a reporter for the freedom of expression of the Telecommunications Organization of Latin America. In addition, Mrs. Chinchilla holds numerous positions in organizations that promote democracy, global trade, and human rights globally. Some of the following, International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, Atlantic Council. She's the vice president of Club of Madrid. She's a board member of the Concordia Summit, Inter-American Dialogue, the International Committee Olympic, and she is the co-chair in the Coffee Announce Foundation of the Commission on Elections and Democracy in the Digital Age. Mrs. Chinchilla was awarded the Woman of the Decade in Public Life and Leadership at the, economic, at the Women Economic Forum in Amsterdam. She holds honorary doctorates from the University for Peace in the United Nations, Georgetown University, and Kyoto University of Foreign Studies. As I said, Mrs. Chinchilla and I are both from Costa Rica, so we will conduct the interview in English. However, to honor our Latin American roots, our last question will be in Spanish. Make sure you stay because we're going to have English subtitles for you to be able to follow the conversation. Welcome, Mrs. Chinchilla. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you so much, Laura. I'm very grateful to, uh, to, to, to have this opportunity to share some reflection with the wonderful people of the Mackenzie family. Thank you so much, Mrs. Chinchilla. And for everyone, I'm gonna probably call her Doña Laura as that is a lot more common for us in Costa Rica. Doña Laura, let's start with the first question I have for you. You are the first female president of Costa Rica and just the fifth woman to be elected as president in the whole of Americas by 2010. In your election speech, you said, wives and working women continue overcoming barriers to make a greater Costa Rica. All the women and men who have accompanied us have made possible that a daughter of this country can be president. What was it like to become the first female president of Costa Rica? Well, becoming the first president of Costa Rica was uh, for me both an honor and a challenge. Uh, beyond the complexities that are inherent to politics, which are the same for either men or women, we women face additional uh, complexities, especially when uh, it is the first time that we assume certain positions because uh, the people are learning to work with women at those uh, levels. So mm -hmm. in my case, uh, I would say that the most important challenge was to confirm once again how difficult it was to overcome the social norms and the stereotypes of female leaders. Mm -hmm. Shortly after I took office, I realized that reaching the summit was only the beginning, Laura, uh, the beginning of a bigger enterprise for women to stay in leadership position is as hard as reaching them. During the whole constitutional period of my mandate, every day was a constant battle to contest those who kept wondering if I was capable of resistant pressures, solving crises, or taking informed decisions. Uh, I can give you uh, some examples. For instance, when uh, a journalist asked me if I had been in a beauty salon getting my nails done, after I had taken a couple of days to work with members of my cabinet in a new tax law. Um, I also remember when um, they, I mean, they used to run polls about my government more frequently than they did it mm -hmm. uh, with, you know, um, uh, men's uh, uh, governments. In order to confirm if my performance was better 
than former mayor presidents. Mm -hmm. so one of those polls even ask specifically if people will vote for a woman again. Let me tell you that I have not found yet a poll in my country or any other country in which people are asked if they will vote again for a male president. So these stories are not exclusive to me. I have shared them with other former presidents and top female politicians who confirmed that they also face similar uh, or similar discriminatory episodes. Sexist views of power are reproduced every day around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, let me give you uh, some important information. According to a study uh, that analyzed more than 20,000 public stories published uh, in traditional and social media in more than 100 countries, in only 24% of these news stories were women the main subject. This wow. figure drops to 16% when those stories relate to politics and government. Now, uh, to finish this first question, uh, I learned two important lessons from these experiences during my presidency. The first one is that you cannot afford to take those situations personally. Mm -hmm. I mean, doing, uh, doing uh, that will demand too much energy and too much time from you and will distract you from what is essential for anyone and that is to achieve your main goals. Of course, you have to fight against discrimination, but as part of an intelligent and well-designed set of policies. And secondly, more than any other legal, material, or physical barrier, social norms are the most complex uh, obstacles uh, to women's aspirations. So confronting prejudice is as hard, uh, but also a fundamental task in pursuing gender equality. That's incredible. Thank you so much for that answer because it really shows how hard it is. And I love your point about it. it's not only about getting there, but it's an everyday struggle against prejudice and perception every day. And, and I, still re I still remember your government with a lot of admiration as a woman myself. How do you think you being elected the first female president of Costa Rica helped change some of the perceptions around women in power? Oh, well, yes, uh, that is a very important question. And I will say that in two different ways, uh, we were able to change uh, perceptions. Uh, in the case of uh, the adults, the, the, uh, you know, the, the older population, uh, I had to do, or, or he had to do with performing the duties of my office and taking responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, the most important promise that I made to the people of my country was to make Costa Rica a safer home for all its citizens. And they believed me based on my previous experience as Minister of Security and Justice. Uh, when Costa Rica elected me as president, there was a security crisis going on. Criminal violence was on the rise and gangs were getting more violent and organized. Um, I appointed an experienced and highly motivated team and we succeeded. Between 2010 and 2014, homicide rates decreased by 30% and femicide rates by 50%. Wow. But when we talk about changing perceptions, the most critical impact is the one that takes place in the youngest generations. That, that is what is most important. Uh, let me tell you a story so you can better understand what I am saying. Children had a very special place during my presidential electoral campaign and during my government too. In Costa Rica, we organized children elections, as you know, which are held the same day of the adults general elections. We do this to teach our children the importance of democracy mm -hmm. and to build a thriving civic culture. Well, in, in, in the two, uh, 2014 presidential elections, I won the children's election by a wider margin than the adults' elections. Oh, wow. That uh, result 
stayed very close to my heart, of course. And that is why I decided soon after winning to visit some of the schools to greet and thank the children. When I arrived to one of the schools, the teachers gave me some beautiful news. The day after I was elected president, several girls announced that they will run for president of huh? their school and high school elections. Later, during my presidency, I visited again, uh, you know, some schools and kindergarten, and in an incredible entertaining, in one of those visits, uh, an entertaining exchange with five-year-old children, I asked them if they would like to become president of Costa Rica. Surprisingly, only girls raised their hand. When I asked one of the boys if he would like to become president one day, his reply was, in order to become a president, you have to be a woman. <laughs> yes, yeah, so at that time, Laura, I became fully aware of the extent of my decision to uh, run for president, to change forever my country's understanding of women's participation in politics. In one little boy, was growing up without holding the prejudice that women are not capable of leading a country. And several girls were growing up fighting for positions of leadership in their schools and high schools. Pursuing the president was worth more than my individual aspirations and dreams of equality of my political party. We were able to change an entire generation. That's incredible. Thank you so much for sharing those examples. Uh, in our organization, we say a lot that it's important to, to have women in leadership roles because you cannot be what you cannot see. It's essentially what you're talking about, right? Having new generations know that women can do as much as men and that in fact, we can do more. Um, that's absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for sharing that. Let me go to a different question, household support. Because as, as you're speaking about everything that you have done, as, as I was reading about everything you've done as a president, and now with uh, all, the board, all the boards you're part of and how you're leading in terms of human rights, from a McKinsey study, we know that more than 75% of the household unpaid work is done by women. We're talking cooking, cleaning, elderly care, child care. Um, and COVID-19 has made that worse, right? So we know that women have dropped the workforce at higher rates than what we can explain by labor dynamics alone. For you to lead the country, you probably had a lot of support from your husband and immediate family. Can you tell me a little bit about the dynamics of that support? And also, what do you think we could do to close the gap of unpaid work for women? Well, thank you for that question because uh, uh, it has to do with a, a wonderful story um, because my husband was very special to my, or not only my um, own personal and intimate life, but also uh, for my professional life, he, uh, he's no longer with me because he passed away three years ago, but they have wonderful memories. Um, um, and, 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 and so this is what happened. Shortly after I decided to pursue a political career, I got pregnant with my son. I have only one son. Immediately, my husband announced me an incredible decision. He had resolved to take up an early retirement. So I was you know, going to be able uh, to uh, continue with my political aspirations. Oh. I have to confess that after this decision, I felt an enormous relief. Uh -huh. uh, I was able to work rather calmly, knowing that my child was in the best possible hands, his father's hands. Um, but I know that this is not the case for most of uh, the women around the world. And I also want to be clear, I am not pretending that our husbands or partners give up their professional ambitions, uh, but that they share in similar conditions the work and responsibilities at home. We know that huge disparities, as, as you mentioned, in women and paid work are some of the main reasons to account for the economic gender disparities. And we also know that economic gender gap is the 
is the worst and more, more pervasive uh, one. Let's remember that the World Economic Forum has estimated in 2020 that the time needed to close the economic gender gap was more than 250 years. Considering the impact of the pandemic, this, this will take us several years more. So I believe that the priority in this post-pandemic world should be to reduce gaps. In general, I think that should be the core of all the policies, how to reduce gaps, but particularly the economic gender gap that's gonna be the best way to boost economic growth and at the same time to promote equality. In order to reduce these gaps, we should enact regulations and promote attitudes that allow women to participate in the workforce and in the business community under equal conditions to those of men. It should include initiatives um, at least, I think, at three levels. Uh, first, close gender pay gap between and within sectors. Secondly, advance more women into management and leadership positions. And third, enable women's participation in the labor force by the provision of child care support. And, and, and precisely one of the most important policies that I implemented during my administration was the early childhood care programs. I was fully aware that I owed my presidency to the collective action of women, mm -hmm. many of them workers and head of households. They massively, massively, excuse me, voted for me, and I had to respond to their most pressing needs. According to um, the studies and surveys that we ran at the time, the main concern of working women was not having alternatives for the care of their children while working, and that is, I mean, and that is still uh, the same. The childcare program. Um, that we designed allow mothers to enter uh, the workforce or to pursue their ambitions uh, to study. Let me tell you that the impact of this program on thousands of women's lives was the most gratifying experience for me in government. And it is very nice to know that it has become the priority of many governments around the world. Early childhood uh, care programs has become one of the most effective responses for this situation we are talking about. Yeah, that's incredible to know, especially now during COVID times, right? It will be, and, and you were saying something that is so important, which is we know for a fact that women in the workplace and gender equality are good for the economy and for society. So helping them with that, it's not only helping women, but it's actually helping our society. Speaking about COVID-19 effects, um, can you tell me a little bit more about what has been the impact in minorities, particularly women, women of color, and other minorities in Latin America? Uh, well, um, uh, the, the impact has been devastating in general, uh, but also in, for, I, I believe the response to introduce uh, some of the situations we are going through here in our region, in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, the first we should say is that there, there is uh, indisputable progress in favor of women's rights. But despite, despite this progress, they continue to suffer from disadvantages, economic, social, and political conditions, making them more vulnerable to situations uh -huh. such as the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, as I previously mentioned, women have suffered disproportionately during this crisis, including job losses, domestic violence, mental health problems, and an increasing burden of domestic uh, labor and childcare. On top of the job losses you mentioned, uh, or we have discussed in previous conversation about, uh, according to the McKenzie figures, is 54% uh, of overall job losses are women uh, Correct. Uh, jobs. Um, women were also more vulnerable in terms of, you know, those problems in the in the in the uh, in the labor market. Uh, women were also more vulnerable to the effects of the pandemic because they mostly work 
in the informal sector of the economy. Uh -huh. In Latin America and the Caribbean, nearly 60% of women were employed in this sector before the pandemic hit us. All these women were left without income during the quarantines and the closures of the economies, uh, which took for many, many, many weeks or, and even months. Moreover, they didn't have social protection programs and access to health services. So they had a higher degree of exposure to the virus and its effects. In addition to the job insecurity, they already had, uh, uh, they, they now um, are suffering of even greater uncertainty about their future because you know, they didn't have any job uh, previously. Uh, an, additional, an additional area of a special concern has to do with the fact that the majority of jobs in the health sector are globally held by women. Mm -hmm. This is also the case in Latin America and the Caribbean where almost 60% of doctors are women, as well as up to nine out of 10 persons who perform nursing functions and other supportive tasks like cooking and cleaning hospitals and, and, and clinics. But the problems don't end there, Laura. Lockdowns led women to become much more exposed to gender-based violence. Prior to the pandemic, one out of three women in the world suffered physical or sexual violence. During the pandemic, the levels of domestic and gender-based violence have multiplied exponentially in many countries. That was the case in Latin America. For example, in Argentina, there was a 25% increase in calls to the emergency lines for reasons related to gender-based violence. In Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, the Domestic Violence Court of Justice reported a 50% increase in complaints wow. of gender-based violence. And in Mexico, the National uh, Women's Institute reported a 60% increase in requests for assistance. So undoubtedly, the feminization of the crisis um, is not an exclusive phenomenon in the case of the pandemic, but a recurring condition in countries especially vulnerable to external and internal shocks, such as climate change, violent conflicts, and others. And that is something that happens in our countries every year. So I think that uh, to, uh, to finish this uh, response, uh, I, I think that this crisis has been a wake up call uh, to intensify measures that will allow us to close the inequality gaps that affect women and other minorities and allow them to become more resilient in the face of future crises. Governments must put different minorities needs at the center of the post pandemic agenda. We must think not only on how to build back better, but also on how to build back equal. I love that. I, I completely agree with you that it's definitely a priority and it sheds some light on all the disparity that we still have to follow. And as you said, a lot has been done to get to gender equality, but definitely COVID has brought us back by many years. So completely agree with you that we have to prioritize that. So we see a lot of challenges that COVID has brought. We have, we have also seen an acceleration of digitization that probably brings opportunities to those women um, and, and, and the workplace. In your experience, how do you think technology can be leveraged by private and public organizations to try to close those, gen those gender gaps, get to gender equality, and also solve for the problem of unemployment, for example? Um. Well, I, I will say that probably this is one of the most important discussions taking place now, which is associated with how to um, how to uh, to recover the economy, but also how again to be inclusive in the process. Uh, as a consequence of COVID nineteen, uh, the world uh, faced uh, unprecedented challenges forced by the pandemic disease. We embrace online learning, redefine face to face networks, uh -huh. and they remove work the new normal. It, it was the perfect storm for digital transformation. However, we have to admit that the perspective for women is not very optimistic unless we do something different. Uh, we already knew 
before the, the pandemic hit the world, that uh, women were not profiting from the digital transformation as much as they could, mm -hmm. in part because many of them didn't have access to digital technologies. Uh, let me give you some figures. Um, according to the OECD, in 2018, women were on average 26 less likely than men to have a smartphone, something mm. very basic today. Huh? And worldwide, about 300 very million fewer women than men had access to mobile internet. Oh. The situation is worse in developing countries like ours, where 60% of women do not have access to new technologies. Another source, the International Telecommunications Union estimated uh, two years ago that the global gender divide in internet usage was growing instead of reducing. And I think that probably now with the pandemic is even worse. So this is why the IMF alerted that women are or were uh, twice as likely as men to be displaced by technology in the next two decades, resulting in around 180 million women losing their jobs globally. And all of those figures were before the pandemic. That's what I want to, to, uh, to, uh, to really, uh, you know, to, um, to underline. These trends will accelerate by the pandemic, unless we take urgent, bold, and swift actions to change the course of the events. In my opinion, we should adopt at least uh, the following kind of policies. Some of them are at the national level. Some of them uh, should be taken at the you know, productive units or public institutions. In the first place, countries have to accelerate the mass use of digital technologies by all sectors of the population through more public and private investment directed to expanding fixed and mobile networks, increasing connectivity, and developing digital industries. This will be the best strategy to boost economic growth based on innovation and low carbon emissions, but also to tackle inequality. Secondly, Governments, companies, multilateral organizations, and NGOs must join efforts and commit to creating ecosystems of opportunities enabled by technology to support and empower women and girls. They can also look for alternative ways to guarantee women equal access to technologies. Finally, policies have to increase the representation of girls in science, technology, engineering, and maths, address gender stereotypes that inhibit women's access to technology and promote gender diversity in funding for women entrepreneurs, among others. We should build on best practices. And if you allow me, I would like to share at least two uh, good practices here in our region. Uh, one is Laboratoria, a nonprofit organization established in uh, 2014 in several Latin American countries that targets girls from low-income families facing major barriers to access higher education. It combines applied coding, education, social-emotional training, employer engagement, and job placement services. It's a wonderful program. Another example is She Works, a social impact initiative of which I am a member of the advisory board. It received the, the, the leadership award at Equals in Tech as one of the most promising and innovative projects that uses technology to bridge the gender unemployment gap. So I am convinced uh, that now more than ever, before the world need more women at the helm. Young women and girls are called to lead the future. And in doing so, we must make technology the best ally. Thank you so much for that answer. As a woman in technology, I completely connect 
with those things. And, and as, as we speak about reskilling women, bringing them into STEM roles, uh, opening opportunities for entrepreneurs in tech, one of the things we probably have to talk about is inclusion. Because once you bring them into technology and other organizations, how do we make sure we include them? And, and let me give you a little bit of context. We know from other McKinsey studies that people in organizations that promote diversity report twice as much as other organizations that they feel they can bring their whole selves to work. And that means that 150% times more, 100, well, 1.5 times more than other organizations, they feel they can bring their ideas, they can put forward projects, and they can help the organization move, move forward their goals. How do you think private and public organizations can promote diversity once we have them? Um, Laura, for me, it's very difficult to speak about the organizations or public institutions uh, with not considering the, the context where they are. So that is why I usually speak about what the nations and government uh -huh. has to do, uh, and also, of course, what the organizations must do. So uh, organizations like nations uh, always win with diversity. That's the first thing I, think, I, I, I should say. In the case of nations, the main source of, because you cannot have, uh, or it's gonna be harder for organizations uh, to promote diversity if they are in a negative context in terms of tolerance and, uh, and diversity. So in the case of nations, uh, the main source of diversity comes from migration, mm -hmm. which is the mirror of cultural values and knowledge that enrich societies. Unfortunately, is it has become one of the most divisive issues in societies today. Migration has been an important pillar for development in my country. So I can speak based on our experience. Mm -hmm. Costa Rica is the nation with the higher percentage of migrants in Latin America in proportion to its population. Uh, we have almost 10% of legal migrants. Uh, we are a very open society that have absorbed people from different nations and their ideas too. I am convinced that thanks to this diversity, Costa Rica has become one of the most stable democracies in the world and one of the most competitive economies in our region. In the case of organizations, Diversity and inclusion foster better employment and employee, employee engagement and productivity, as, as you mentioned, and allow for greater levels of innovation. Also, uh, and this is very relevant given the COVID-19 crisis, some studies found that companies with pro-diversity policies were more resilient during past crises, mm -hmm. such as the uh, 2008 financial crisis. So it should be very obvious that a broader range of people have a wider range of interests, experiences, and backgrounds to draw upon. They can better understand what the people, I mean, users, consumers, citizens, etc., are asking for or looking for. So what else to do to promote diversity beyond uh, the nations? At the, at, the, at the organizational and institutional level. Well, in the case, and let, let me go back to the nations uh, once more because I didn't finish with some of the, of the reflections. In the case of nations, it is essential to make tolerance a core value that is instilled in citizens from childhood within families and especially in schools. Education system that promote any sort of segregation should be avoided at all costs. In that sense, I have always been a defender of the Costa Rican educational system that for many years bet on public funded universal access where boys and girls of different economic, uh, economic social and racial origins meet and share as equal in the classroom. Although the situation has changed, uh, the majority of our children still go to public schools. In the case of private, and public organization, it is essential to understand that diversity must be assured with particular emphasis on the composition of the board of directors, since this is the place where policies are taken. So we should start by putting 
uh, you know, uh, people with different backgrounds at the board of different organizations. Some studies report that 50% of global companies do not have a woman on the board mm -hmm. yet. But that is just the tip of the iceberg since only 3% of the board seats are held by women of color. So organization model look for full diversity considering not only gender, but also religion, race, age, ethnicity, sexual orientation, cognitive abilities and disabilities and other kind of attributes in order to thrive in a more diverse and sophisticated uh, world. Moreover, organizations sh should also understand the importance of embracing the philosophy of uh, cultural act instead of cultural fit. Whereas cultural fit refers to employees conforming or adapting to the norms of an organization, cultural act implies an organization actively embracing diversity in their norms mm -hmm. and knowledge different cultural practices and making inclusion as part of their core business strategy. For example, we know Mackenzie is highly committed to creating a gender balanced, diverse, equitable, and inclusive environment. The diversity and inclusion, inclusion program you lead, Laura, at the tech organization is an example of how leaders can commit to driving cultural change and embedding inclusion as part of their core values and team norms. I praise you and McKinsey, of course, for this. Uh, thank you so much, Doña Laura. And I, I, I definitely see it myself personally, what you're talking about, tolerance, accepting, changing cultures rather than trying to fit everyone in a single box, actually enjoying the differences. Uh, I, I can definitely attest to what you're saying. My teams are a lot more innovative because we're from so many different backgrounds. Um, thank you so much for that answer. Because all, 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 all of us gain, even in a personal uh, dimension, Sharing with different people is something really wonderful. You learn a lot. Absolutely. Thank you. And, and, you know, you were talking about board members and women in leadership positions. I actually want to go to that one as well, because we're talking about diversity, including, including that diversity in our organizations. And with that also comes making sure, going back to your first example of how little girls now see you as an example of, wow, I can become a president. Let's talk about women um, leading. And in this case, since we, you and I have been talking about COVID, let's talk about why is it that women led governments? have managed the consequences of COVID in their, in their countries a lot better than most of their male counterparts. And these are examples, for example, we have Finland, Germany, New Zealand, Norway. It is most illuminating in terms of the number of cases, but also the number of deaths per 100,000. I believe it's, I, I heard it's about 40% of the best managed cases in terms of COVID were managed by women. Why do you think that is? Yes, well, that is, that is a very important question that, that precisely uh, uh, right now. Um, let me, let me uh, give you a, a, a previous reflection before going into uh, the uh, specifics of your question. But according to, uh, to what I have seen and have read and I have been participating in many different forums discussing this, kind of, you know, pandemic and post-pandemic consequences and trying to explain the whys of many things. Uh -huh. But there are two major factors that help to explain why some nations have done a better job than others in dealing with the pandemic disease. And one is the quality of the welfare and political institutions. And the other is the quality of leadership. With regards to the first element, the quality of the institution, uh, institutions, it was clear that the capacity of states to provide rapid and efficient responses, particularly in the health, education, and financial services, made a significant difference from one country to another. In those states with underfinance programs, widespread corruption, or lacking policy coordination, the response to the pandemic was disastrous. Uh, unfortunately, 
Uh, unfortunately, that was the case in most of the uh, Latin American countries, a region that accounts for almost third of the deaths globally with only 8% of the world population. Concerning the quality of leadership, more specifically from members of uh, the governments, what we witnessed from some leaders was truly appalling in, in some nations. Denials of the pandemic from heads of state who hosted and promoted public mass events, costed the life of thousands of people. And also since the pandemic offered opportunities to expand executive powers under declarations of a state of emergency, some leaders undermine the rule of law and constitutional checks and balances. And we have ex examples of this all around the world. Of course, here in Latin America, but in many other developed nations too. So, but what is interesting is the fact that almost 100% of governments headed by women manage pretty well the pandemic situation. Beyond the individual strengths that, and, and, and merits uh, of those female leaders, I think that there are some features of leadership most commonly found among women. These features are particularly relevant in conditions like those we are experiencing with the pandemic uh, disease. Uh, specifically, specifically, excuse me, I refer to the following three conditions. The first is a combination of respect with discipline. Women tend to display a distinctive approach to power. And that has been the experience with all head of states that I have you know, uh, engaged with. Uh, our approach to power is a less arrogant, it's less arrogant. We have a less arrogant attitude and much more willing to listen and to conform policy with respect and discipline to technical and scientific criteria. The pandemic was a situation where politicians have been forced to abide like probably never before to science mm -hmm. and to technicians. And so this kind of dialogue between politicians and scientists or technicians are going to be decisive in shaping policies amid the planetary changes that the world will face ahead. What I, what I want to say is that we will need more of this and not less of this kind of leadership. The second is empathy. Women have an increased ability to identify with other people's feelings and needs. As women leaders, we have had to navigate more challenges, less accepting political environments, which may fork uh, within us greater interest in bridging social divides, building social cohesion and consensus as opposed to polarizing and divisive uh, approaches to governing. Mm -hmm. This is a moment where the conditions of leadership, such as compassion and solidarity are being put to test. Leaders must be able to ask their citizens to some sacrifices or for some sacrifices in order to protect the most vulnerable sectors. And finally, women's typically collaborative leadership style is well suited to coalition building and dialogue. Much necessary conditions in moments in which leaders need to engage in a day-to-day -day conversation with many sectors and with the population at large in order to build support around the complex decisions that they have to adopt. Uh, if some still have doubts about the ability of women to lead the pandemic is the best confirmation that we are even in the most adverse circumstances. I love that. Thank you. And it's such a great way to close up to what you were talking at the beginning of the conversation about changing perception of women in power. Um, thank you so much for that, Doña Laura. We are now going to move to our last question and I'm very excited to move to Spanish. But as I said, please stick with us. If you only speak English, we have English subtitles. Um, Doña Laura, muchísimas gracias. Me ha encantado esta conversación con usted. Uh, la verdad que ha sido súper importante para 
para subrayar lo importante que es ponerle atención a temas de equidad e inclusión para mujeres, que pongamos atención a lo grave que ha sido la pandemia para grupos minoritarios y lo importante que es la diversidad para nuestra economía y la sociedad. Eh, quisiera hacerle una pregunta personal eh, para mí y para muchísimos otros si usted pudiera devolverse en el tiempo y hablar con Laura Chinchilla de 20 años y también para todas las mujeres jóvenes que quieren como usted romper paradigmas y, y tomar un, un rol de liderazgo global ¿qué les diría? Eh, gracias por esa pregunta eh, Laura y, y te quiero decir que además he disfrutado mucho eh, esta oportunidad y esta conversación contigo. Eh, si yo me devolviera a los 20 años, eh, cuando tenía 20 años, en realidad no es mucho lo que haría diferente. Y, 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 y quiero contar un poco más de mi historia personal para explicar por qué digo esto. Eh, hemos hablado a lo largo de esta conferencia eh, o de esta conversación, que uno de los obstáculos más difíciles que enfrentan las mujeres, eh, el obstáculo más importante, de acuerdo a muchos estudios que ya lo han documentado, eh, es el, son los prejuicios. Eh, y así como los prejuicios están en mucha de la gente que nos rodea, un estudio global reciente, identificó que solamente uno de cada diez hombres y tres de cada diez mujeres presentan cero prejuicios eh, a la hora de analizar la capacidad de las mujeres frente a la capacidad de los hombres. Vean ustedes cuán lejos estamos todavía de derrotar esos prejuicios, esos sesgos en contra de las mujeres. Bueno, pero así como esos prejuicios se han sembrado eh, a lo largo de toda la historia, en las personas que nos rodean, así también eh, crecemos nosotros o nosotras con esos prejuicios. Desde que somos niñas, desde que nacemos en el seno de las familias, hay muchos mensajes que se nos mandan, a veces de manera consciente o inconsciente, diciéndonos que somos más débiles, más volátiles, menos aptas para hacer muchas cosas que los hombres las hacen y se les autorizan con normalidad. Uh -huh. Por eso es que yo siempre digo que entonces parte de la tarea que tenemos que hacer es garantizar que desde niñas las familias puedan educar, puedan educarlas de la misma manera, que a los niños no tiene que haber distinción alguna, eh, por lo menos no en lo que respecta a sus aspiraciones. Yo tuve la gran fortuna, Laura, de nacer en una familia eh, en donde era la única mujer, eran cuatro hermanos varones. Sin embargo, papá y mamá nunca hicieron ninguna distinción en la forma en que me formaron a mí y en la que formaron a mis hermanos. Lo que a ellos les negaban, a mí me los negaban, lo que a ellos les autorizaban, a mí me lo autorizaban. Y entonces yo crecí con mucho menos complejos que con los que crecieron muchas mujeres de mi generación. Y creo que por eso siempre vi con mucha naturalidad el que me ofrecieran ser la primera mujer ministra de seguridad de este país, un mundo que era totalmente de hombres cuando yo apenas tenía 35 años. O vi con mucha naturalidad aspirar a convertirme en presidenta de mi país, porque para mí no había distinción entre las cosas que yo como mujer y como niña y como adolescente podía aspirar a conseguir eh, porque así me habían criado. Eh, y recuerdo que a los 20 años, además, volviendo a esto de tu pregunta, decidí aventurarme por los caminos de Centroamérica, cuando Centroamérica estaba en guerra, para conocer de cerca la guerra, wow. porque Costa Rica era muy diferente al resto de las naciones. Eh, y yo quería saber qué era eso de la guerra, qué era eso de tener ejércitos cuando Costa Rica no lo tenía. Y ya era claro que a mí me gustaba la política. Y fue una maravilla cuando papá y mamá, sin subestimarme en absoluto, pidiéndome algunas condiciones que garantizaban que me iba a cuidar, me dijeron, del paso adelante, vaya adelante. Y yo creo que este tiene que ser nuestro principal mensaje, Laura, a todas las niñas, a todas las jóvenes, den siempre ese paso adelante, no inhibirlas de hacerlo, porque además nosotras las mujeres tenemos un problema. 
Eh, y tengo una amiga que lo expresa muy bien. Es una gran escritora latinoamericana. Y ella lo que dice es que eh, la, las mujeres a veces somos tímidas en exceso. Eh, y que esa especie de timidez en nosotras las mujeres es una virtud más bien mediocre. Eh, que nosotras las mujeres tenemos más bien que procurar ser más posadas. Y entonces mi mensaje es, si esas niñas, si esas adolescentes, si esas mujeres que nos están escuchando hoy todavía arrastran esas eh, presiones internas que las hacen muchas veces dudar de su capacidad, si cada vez que en la empresa les ofrecen una oportunidad se lo piensan dos y tres veces, mientras que ellos los varones sin pensarlo dicen que sí, entonces mi consejo es atrévanse, atrévanse siempre porque ustedes tienen la capacidad, son tan buenas, tan competitivas como ellos y en muchos casos pueden serlo muchísimo más, entonces mi mensaje fundamental es ese, siempre confiemos en nuestro propio potencial, demos ese paso que estoy segura que vamos a conseguir hacerlo eh, de una manera fabulosa. Maravilloso mensaje para terminar, doña Laura. De verdad le agradezco muchísimo su tiempo. Eh, vamos, eh, vamos a aprender muchísimo de esta entrevista. No puedo aguantar el momento en que podamos ponerla en vivo para todos los demás.